let's continue with the tropical stuff. Uh, Professor uh, Hannah Markwick will continue with, with her explanation, particularly, uh, I think uh, you should uh, revise that uh, uh, valuation thing a little bit for the participants so that uh, they can uh, uh, follow up everything. Uh, unfortunately, we lost the recording for your yesterday's lecture. We uh, forgot to switch on, plug in uh, the uh, recording in between. So probably going back will make a cover of uh, yesterday's lost a little bit. Okay, great. Yeah, let's do that. Right. Thank you. So, okay, yeah. Welcome back, everyone, to the third class in the series of four lectures on tropical geometry. So yesterday we introduced, oopsie, again, it's still red. Let me change that to more nicer color. So we started introducing a funny field to do algebraic geometry with, namely the field of preserved series. And a preserved series is just a formal series, converging doesn't play any role here, just a formal series where the coefficients are in the ground field, in my case, C, and the exponents are rational numbers, and they need to share a common denominator in order to make multiplication well-defined. And then I have the valuation going from the field of previous series to uh, union infinity. And it sends such a series as above to the smallest exponent. And the series zero goes to infinity. And this valuation satisfies three axioms. Satisfies the three axioms of a so-called non-Archimedean valuation. The first is the valuation of a number is infinity if and only if this number is zero. The second is the valuation of a product is the sum of the valuations. And the third is the valuation of a sum is less than or equal to the minimum of the valuations. with equality if the valuations are not equal. Okay, and yesterday we checked that our valuation on the field of preserved series indeed satisfies those three axioms. Is this something you would like me to repeat now or, or maybe later when we try to repeat the recording or shall we just go on for the moment? Yeah, yeah I think just go on. I think- uh, Just go on for the moment. They can, yeah, yeah, they, can, they will pick it up. Okay, great. Okay. Um, then what we did is we defined the tropicalization map and because we're interested in plane curves, we let it start in the plane over our field, except we, we take out the zeros. We take only the non-zero elements in our field to avoid the infinities. You don't have to do that, but it's just a little easier for the moment. And the tropicalization map sends a tuple consisting of two points just to minus val and minus val. And we also introduced the tropicalization of a polynomial over the field of preserved series. So let, 
let us consider a polynomial sum over c mu x to the mu one y to the mu two in preserve series a joint x y then the tropicalization of p is defined to be well we make all the operations tropical operations so instead of the big sum we write a big max but then the coefficients which are preserved series we also replace with minus val of the coefficients okay and then the times is going becoming plus again and we obtain a tropical polynomial like that and then we had this very important theorem by Kapranov stating that for such a P, let me not repeat it, we take the same P as above, the same polynomial as above. If we take the tropicalization of the plane curve defined by P, of the zero locus defined by P, and the Euclidean closure, because we only get a dense subset in Q to the two, we want a graph in R to the two, then you this mean, is the same. Excuse me. Sorry? Uh, uh, you mean the commas instead of addition in the above prop of P? What did it, sorry? I'm, I'm not sure I understood. Uh, what did I? Uh, uh, what kind of max you are computing? So you are computing the minus? The maximum over, uh -huh, this is a sum over some u, then this is the max over some u. Ah, okay, 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 okay. Yeah, makes sense? Okay. Yeah, thanks for the question. Okay, so if we take the tropicalization of our plane curve in the sense above, taking minus val point wise, coefficient wise, component wise, sorry, then this is the same as the tropical plane curve defined by the tropical polynomial given by P. And this theorem is so important because this left-hand side tells us we're talking about some sort of degeneration of an algebraic plane curve. And admittedly, the degeneration is really very strong because all we keep from our points in the algebraic plane curves are just the minus the smallest exponents of those whole preserved series points, right? So this is a very strong degeneration, but it's interesting to see that there's still so much information which is preserved. And that's something I'm hoping to show you in the uh, today and in the remaining time tomorrow also. But what is the right-hand side? The right-hand side, and this is something we studied in the first class is um, uh, weighted, piecewise linear graph in R2, satisfying the balancing condition at every vertex. So the left-hand side explains to us why those objects are coming from algebraic geometry, why they have a meaning in algebraic geometry. And the right-hand side gives us a combinatorial interpretation. Once we are on the right-hand side, we can draw funny pictures like the ones we've drawn all the time. And now the idea, the hope is that we can use those funny pictures to find out something about the algebraic curves. And that has been achieved already. That has been um, particularly successful also in enumerative geometry, which I also mentioned at the start of this class. And this is where I'm heading. I want to show you how successful this is in enumerative geometry. For this, I want to start with another example of a tropical plane curve. And with this example, I want to discuss with you how the genus can be reflected on the tropical side. So what do we know about algebraic plane curves and what could we try to find on the tropical side? Algebraic plane curves, we can view them as Riemann surfaces. So they have a genus, right? 
view the Riemann surfaces, they can have a bunch of holes. And uh, then this is the genus of our algebraic plane curve. And they have a degree. And the degree is the degree of the defining polynomial. So the questions I want to answer today are, what is the genus and what is the degree on the tropical side? And if there's more time, we'll also discuss more about counting curves. Okay, but let's start with the genus. Um, I don't know how, how much, how, how strong your algebraic geometry background is. I suppose the background is a bit diverse. Some people may have a stronger, other people maybe not. But I hope that you heard about cubic plane curves, meaning um, curves which are defined by a polynomial of degree three. And if such a cubic plane curve is smooth, then it is of genus one. And one way to try to see that is that a sketch of such a smooth cubic surf. I hope it's some a picture that you've all seen you can sketch such a cubic plane curve for example like this but of course this is a real picture only and right now we are doing complex algebraic geometry so this picture is a bit of a lie and what is happening there actually happening two things one thing is that i'm sort of missing an infinite point and the other thing is that i'm only taking the real locus so the real locus so the picture I've drawn below is a Riemann surface of genus one, yeah, like Taurus or a donut, yeah. And this complex Riemann surface of genus one, if I consider only the real part, so the, the complex conjugation is like an involution working on this. And the parts which are fixed under this involution are sort of only two circles. But then in this real picture, I'm in addition missing an, uh, an infinite point, so to say, a point that I have to use in order to compactify. And so those two circles, or well, one is not quite a circle, one is a circle minus a point. This is what I see in the real picture. Yeah? So this is one way to sort of understand why the genus of a, a cubic plane curve is smooth, very intuitive way using just pictures right now. Okay. And then um, if it has a node, then it has genus zero. We also say it is rational. That's just a synonym. And the sketch for this, um, the real sketch would be a, a cubic with a node. It looks like something like this. And the sketch on the level of Riemann surfaces is that we take such a torus and the node is like pinching. So we take a circle and we make the circle smaller and smaller. This is hard to draw now. I'm trying. Circle smaller and smaller until this, the circle is gone. This is when, then when the node really appears. But now you see those two parts of the Riemann surface, they only touch each other. So we can as well open this here. And then you get something that is homeomorphic to a sphere, and the sphere has genus zero, of course. Yeah. So this is the story about cubics. If they are smooth, they have genus one. If they have a node, they have genus zero. And now we're going to study um, an example of a tropicalization of a cubic. I'm going to give you the precise polynomial, even though this will be too much to check it just now on time, check all the computations just now on time. But maybe if you find some time later, if you're interested, you can really go through the computations. Or alternatively, you can also just believe that I did the computations correctly. I think I did. In any case, I'm going to write down now a precise polynomial over the Prezi series. And you know, for the sake of being able to compute something, of course, my Prezi series are all finite series. 
Otherwise, I wouldn't be able to write them down. So this is our polynomial over the previous series in two variables. And you can see that it is indeed a polynomial of degree three. So it defines a cubic, a plain cubic. And now I'm going to sketch the tropicalization for you. And just for the sake of better understanding the combinatorics of the tropicalization, I'm going to start by drawing the dual subdivision. So they all have height zero. Let me draw the heights as little numbers next to the points. This has minus three. This has minus three. This point has minus five is not visible therefore. This point has minus five. The other points don't show up. They have like coefficient minus infinity, which is the additive neutral, right? So the subdivision looks like this and the curve looks like this. This is an end of weight two. And the vertices are at zero, zero, five over two, zero, zero, three, zero minus three, two thirds, 11 thirds, minus 11 thirds, sorry. Okay. Now, as I said, this, I, I seriously don't expect you to be able to follow this just on time. It would be weird if you could. Um, I do hope that you understand how I did this, right? So one thing, the first thing I did, of course, is take those coefficients, understand what minus val is for them, then let minus val be the heights in my Newton subdivision, study this roof construction in one dimension higher, project it down to get the dual subdivision, and then go through every polygon set my equalities in order to solve for the location of the vertex, right? So that's a game we played for some smaller tropical curves um, in the last times. And this is a bit, just a bit of a bigger computation, but it is the same principle. So you need more time because it's bigger, but it works in the same way. Okay, why did I give you this example? Because if you, um, if you look at this, this cubic, sorry, now I found my notes. Um, then you figure out that the plane cubic has a node because at one one, the polynomial vanishes, the derivative with respect to X vanishes and the derivative with respect to Y vanishes. And if you have some algebraic geometry background, this you know that this means that there has to be a singularity. And in this case, it's going to be a node. If you don't, I hope you don't mind to just believe for the moment that this means that our cubic has a node. But if our cubic has a node, then we expect our cubic to be of genus zero, to be rational, right? If we look at this graph picture of the tropical curve, however, it does not look like a rational graph, like a tree. It looks like there was a genus. It looks like there is some something like a cycle here, right? Okay, but we don't really like this. We want this to be a rational curve. And so what we do is that we yet again, change our perspective on tropical curves a bit by doing the following, we want to view tropical plane curves, not as embedded graphs, but as parameterized graphs. Now I need, I don't want to erase too many things, but let me just erase some of those pictures to have some more space to write down this conclusion, what we want to do. View tropical plane curves, not as embedded graphs, but 
what? As, yeah, as maps with a graph and a map, such that gamma is an abstract graph. And phi maps this graph into the plane, satisfying some conditions. We can make this precise. We, we need the image to be like what we consider the tropical plane curve so far. So the image phi of gamma, maybe I should just write it, sorry. Um, such that phi of gamma is a plane tropical curve, is a, no, is a weighted. piecewise linear graph satisfying balancing. That's the solution to this problem. I want to also call this parameterize tropical plane curves because we parameterize them by an abstract graph. Yeah, and how do we do this for our picture here? Let me now erase the dual Newton subdivision. We don't need it anymore. And let me instead draw the abstract graph that we use in order to parameterize this tropical curve. The abstract graph will now be of genus zero. It'll be a tree and it looks like this. And then we map this graph over here such that this end here is going to be mapped here. And this rounded edge here is going to be mapped here. Yeah, so those, those two edges meet and cross, but we don't treat this as a vertex. So this here is not a vertex, not a vertex. It is only a crossing of two edges. Yeah, and if we do this, then we can really understand this tropical plane cubic as a rational tropical plane cubic in the sense that the parameterizing graph has genus zero, like we want it to be in a sense, because we want the tropicalization to reflect the, the algebraic world. We want the tropicalization to behave like the algebraic curves behave. Okay. So now we can introduce this a bit better, maybe. So we'll first define what an abstract tropical curve is. We have the choice to, uh, uh, again, uh, delete zero, zero, or maybe the other one, or this is possibly the only option in the available example. Um, this is the only option, in fact, in the available example, because the other vertices, let me just sketch the uh, picture. Um, the other vertices are three valent and you can't do anything. Here, you can view this as a crossing, right? If I draw it the way I draw it already, you understand that I mean it's a crossing. But the, mm -hmm. the, for the other vertices, it's not possible to, to do something like that, right? And this is not a coincidence because Zero, zero is the tropicalization of the node. We saw the node was at one, one. And what's the valuation of one? It's zero and minus zero is zero. So the tropicalization of one, one is zero, zero. So this point is the tropical node, the tropicalization of the node. No, no, it's clear. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So this is why we had to sort of resolve the zero, zero. <clears throat> Okay. So an abstract tropical curve is a metric graph. Let me just add, you know, in order to be precise, the word explicit because people also study other abstract tropical curves. And so if you compare with the literature, this makes sense. An abstract tropical curve is a metric graph gamma with unbounded edges, which we call ends, 
And the ends have infinite length. And the genus is the first Betty number of the underlying graph. The genus of a connected, let me also restrict to connected, tropical curve is the first Betty number of the underlying graph. Um, doesn't have to be metric for that, but that's okay. And because using Euler characteristics, we can write the genus as one minus the number of vertices plus the number of bounded edges. And if you're not familiar with Betty numbers of graphs, you can just take that as the definition of the genus, as the genus of uh, abstract curve. And then we consider parameterized plain tropical curve. And that is something that we had the idea to do that already, and we almost did, but let me nevertheless do this. So it's a tuple gamma phi, such that gamma is an abstract tropical curve. And phi is a map, which is integer affine linear on each edge. And then we also require that the balancing condition is satisfied. And I have to pre make precise what I mean by what, what the consequences are. Okay, how are the weights given in particular? <clears throat> so if I have an edge, it has a length, right? Because it's a metric graph. So the edges have length. The ends have infinite length. The bounded edges have a finite length. <clears throat> if I have an edge of length L, then it is mapped to a segment. It's an integer affine linear map, so it has to map to a segment of a line of rational slope. Of a line with a rational slope. And let's say this segment connects two points, A, A in R2, and A plus length times weight times a primitive vector. These are both points in, in A. And so the weight is implicit given in the map, yeah? So I have this, I have some abstract graph, I have some edge E here. This edge is mapped somewhere, maybe these are the vertices zero, zero, and two, zero. This edge has length one. This edge, it looks like it has length two. It connects zero, zero, plus, but then it connects zero, zero plus the length L, which is one times two times the primitive direction, which is one zero. Um, yeah, that is two zero. It connects zero zero with this point two zero. Yeah, so the weight is implicit in the map. And then the balancing condition is just the usual balancing condition we knew already, we already discussed. And I want to stress again and repeat again, it's important to change our perspective on tropical plane curves by viewing them as something being parameterized by a graph, because if we do that, the genus will be preserved under tropicalization. And that's something we want. We want the genus to be preserved. Okay, so that about the genus. Now, what about the degree? The degree is actually not so bad. Because if we have a polynomial of degree D, and let's assume that it has all the terms it can have, 
So it will have a constant term leading in my Newton polygon to the exponent vector 0, 0. And then it can have all kinds of terms. And then it will also have the exponent vector d0 for the term x to the d, right? And in the same way, it will have the term y to the d leading to 0 d. And so um, the Newton polygon will be this triangle of size d. And then this triangle can be subdivided somehow. Let's not discuss it too precisely somehow, right? And then we have the dual tropical curve. And we don't know much about the dual tropical curve, but what we know is that it has ends and it has d ends in each direction. It looks like something in the middle. We don't even know how precisely, but it has d ends in each of the particular directions. So the tropical plane curve has d ends in each of the three directions, minus one, zero, zero, minus one, and one, one. And yesterday, we studied carefully the tropicalization of a line, also following Kapranov's theorem with that, understanding how Kapranov's theorem works. And the line is a curve of degree one. Of course, it's given by a linear equation by a polynomial of degree one. And we see that it has precisely one end in each direction. So that makes sense. So we understand the, um, what the genus is and we understand what the degree is. And our next steps are going to lead us towards how to count tropical plane curves or how to count algebraic curves. So let me say a little bit about this. How to count algebraic plane curves. And I want to introduce um, a number, a plane curve count, which is called NDG. And that is the number of, well, let me, not real complex, complex algebraic plane curves. Of degree D and genus G passing through 3D plus G minus one points in general position. Okay, so yeah, this is a number. We can just write it down. We don't understand it just because we wrote it down. Let's discuss a few examples. If D is one and the genus is zero, then we are just talking about lines. 3D plus G minus one is then two points. So we see that this number is indeed the right number to fix a line. So this is the number of lines through two points. And you all know this answer. You all know how many lines pass through two points. If I fix two points in the plane, that's precisely one line. That's that, okay. This is the only easy example, unfortunately. <laughs> now it's getting worse. Um, if we discuss N20, we are studying the number of conics, meaning plane curves of degree two, through five points. Now, for those of you who have some algebraic geometry background, it is possible that you had this exercise. It's an exercise in Hartshorn to compute how many conics pass through five points. It's again one, there's no picture that seriously shows how, how that works. I can try to sketch a conic in five points, but um, yeah, it's 
yeah, it doesn't really transport that much meaning as the line through two points, but it's a computation that a beginner in algebraic geometry can do. If we do N3 zero, we're talking about cubics. As we learned earlier, cubics, if they are smooth, have genus one. Now we require the genus to be zero. So these are rational cubics, meaning they have a node. Number of rational cubics through eight points. This number was also known since a long time ago. It's 12. Yet again, it's not so easy to compute. You would not give it as an exercise to an algebraic geometry class, even not to an advanced probably. Um, it does require some, some serious, more serious techniques, but nevertheless, it works to compute this number with, um, yeah, with classical methods, let me say. Now it's getting worse and worse. If we compute N40, it's 620. And N50, I don't have it in my head, unfortunately, but it's actually a five digit number. And six zero is a six digit number. So those numbers are growing really extremely fast. And it's not a surprise that they have been unknown for quite a long time. So this is the number we are after somehow. And first of all, it's a number in the algebraic world, right? And it's, as I said in the beginning, when I started talking about enumerative geometry, in writing down the definition is not so bad. You can explain this definition to students who begin to study algebraic geometry. You can, in a sense, even explain this definition to people who don't know that much about math, right? You just have to somehow and make them understand what a degree and what a genus is. And then we're just counting curves through points. The first example about lines through two points, everyone understands, right? So the definition is not so bad to understand, but the answers are really complicated. And I should also mention that those numbers have been computed before. There are recursive formulas for them that do not need to rely on tropical geometry. But um, nevertheless, tropical geometry provides a new answer to how to compute these numbers, which I find very interesting, and which is sort of at the basis of tropical geometry as a successful tool in enumerative geometry. Once you understood this case very carefully, you can also use tropical geometry to compute new numbers, which have not been known before. So how do we use tropical geometry to compute such numbers? First, let us try to understand where this number 3d plus g minus one number of points is coming from. Why do we need to fix that many points in order to produce a finite count of tropical plane curves? For that, I want to give you a glimpse of an idea about the so-called modelized space of parameterized tropical curves. and its dimension. And when I say modelized space, I want you to think just parameterizing space. So as a first uh, perspective on this, you can just think of a set such that each point in the set corresponds to a tropical curve. Yeah, so it's just something that parameterizes a set of all tropical curves. But we will see, why can we talk about something like a dimension if it's only a set? It's not only a set, it has a structure and it has the structure as an abstract polyhedral complex, you can say. So it's somehow produced by a polyhedra and polyhedra have a dimension. And as such, this modelized space also has a dimension. And I also want to mention that there are tons of things which I am not explaining in this class. I think that's obvious, of course, because I mean, four hours is quite something. You can explain a lot in four hours of teaching, but you still can't explain everything that there is in, in this world somehow. So I, I won't be able to give you a full construction of this modelized space. I only, I can only give you some idea. 
So the first idea I want to give is I want to talk about the combinatorial type of one tropical plane curve. So let's fix one tropical plane curve, combinatorial type. So we have such a tuple gamma phi, such that phi of gamma is, you know, one of those pictures we are used to, or precisely that, you know, just as an idea. Is a weighted piecewise linear graph in R2 satisfying balancing. Okay. And um, remember, gamma phi was defined such that gamma is an abstract tropical curve. So gamma has a metric, has length on its edges, and phi is a map, which is integer affine linear on each edge. And the combinatorial type is obtained when you just forget the length. So let me sketch a tropical curve. Let me not sketch a tropical curve of a certain degree, just a local picture, maybe like this with a crossing here, yeah, just to be in this world of parameterized tropical curves. And now we look at this and uh, the combinatorial type is when we forget the length. The length of the nth are infinity. So we have only this length to forget. So other tropical curves of the same combinatorial type would be something like this or something like this. The length can be longer, the length can be smaller. That's what we don't want to fix, right? Um, sorry, and not only the length and the shift of the image. So we can also shift the image around as I did here. This point can be here or there. We can shift it around. That's the combinatorial type. Okay, and now what's the dimension or what's the set of tropical curves of a fixed combinatorial type? What is the set? of tropical curves of a fixed combinatorial type. Well, what we can do is, of course, we can shift around the tropical curve in R2. So that's an R2. And then in addition, we can vary length. So we take an R uh, bigger zero to the number of bounded edges, because these are the lengths we can vary, right? So for example, for my curve up here, the set of all tropical curves of this combinatorial type would be an R2 times R bigger zero. And the R2, you can view it as like the coordinate of this vertex. So let me call this x, y, and the r bigger zero is l, x, y, and l. In here, if you give me x, y, and l, I will draw one tropical curve of this combinatorial type. Yeah, you tell me where, where this point should be. I don't know, maybe at minus two, minus three, wherever that is, right? And then you tell me what length you want, maybe five, and then I draw a really long edge here, if my pen works. Okay, and you know, then I draw this curve. Okay. Yeah, so, so that's good because that tells us already something about the dimension, but we have to be careful because we cannot necessarily always vary the length independently, but we cannot necessarily in my example, we could, there was just one length. We could make it as long as we want or as short as we want. But in general, we cannot necessarily vary length independently.
And the reason is that cycles have to close up. So let me again draw a local picture of a plain tropical curve of some degree. And now let's give those length names. And then you see that in order for the cycle to be a cycle to close up, we need L1 to be equal to L2 and L3 to be equal to L4. We cannot vary those independently. We can make the cycle smaller or bigger. Yeah, keeping the directions of all edges because they are fixed by the combinatorial type. We can make it bigger, smaller, however we like, but we always need this length to be equal to this length and this length to be equal to this length. Otherwise it would not be such a cycle, right? And that means that each cycle gives two conditions. And that means we, so this is going to be our surrounding space for the polyhedron that parameterizes all tropical curves of a given combinatorial type. But we will have some equations that cut something smaller dimensional out of the surrounding polyhedron. And we will have precisely two G equations two equations for every cycle, and we have G cycles because we are of genus G, okay? So let's write down this dimension. So, um, sorry, I need to search for a number. Yeah, okay. So by induction, we can show a three valent, abstract tropical curve with 3D ends has 3D minus 3 plus 3G bounded edges. I forgot one requirement here, abstract tropical curve of genus G. And that is the situation we need to discuss because we care for tropical curves of degree D and genus G and the graph, the abstract graph has then genus G. And in order for our abstract curve to parameterize a curve of degree D, we need the abstract curve to have three D ends. Yeah, D ends in each of the three directions. And as I said, you can show by induction that if the curve is three valent, then we have 3D minus three plus 3G bounded edges. Why is three valent important? This will give us the maximal number somehow. If you have a four valent vertex somewhere, let me try to come up with a good sketch for this. Something like this, a four valent vertex. Ah, sorry, this is sort of hard to draw. Let me try to draw the dual picture first so that you get an idea of what I mean to be drawing here, what directions I mean to be drawing here. So let me consider such a four valent vertex. A bit more like this, not supposed to be a crossing, right? If I have something like this, then I can always resolve it. Resolve. And then I have one more bounded edge. Resolve higher valent vertex. Obtain more bounded edges and more bounded edges means more dimension because we saw that we have in, in principle a dimension for every bounded edge. If we have a three valent vertex on the other hand, there's no way to resolve. This is just the way it is. And for that reason, three valent types are the types that will give us the biggest dimension. And now, as I said, we do induction, we count the bounded edges, we obtain this number. And now what's the dimension? The dimension for that reason is, so we have two for a shift. So this is R to the two um, times R biggest zero to the number of bounded edges. number of bounded edges is 3D minus three plus 3G. But then as we said, we have to subtract again. 
subtract for um, equalities that have to be satisfied for the cycles. And we saw that we obtained two equalities for each cycle, like for this cycle, L1 is L2 and L3 is L4. Okay, and now we compute this number and we see that we obtain 3D plus G minus one. So that is the dimension of our modelized space of abstract tropical curves. And for that reason, if we go and fix points, we will reduce somehow the dimension by one. And if we fix 3D plus G minus one points, we will obtain a finite set of tropical curves passing through those points. So that's the conclusion I want to draw. Thus, if we fix 3D plus G minus one points in general position, there is a finite count, finite set, let me just say, finite set of tropical curves of degree D and genus G passing through them. And this is where I want to continue next time then, because I want to define a number that is totally analogous to the number we discussed in the algebraic world. I want to define a number which is called N of DG trop. And the definition will be very similar to the definition we discussed in algebraic geometry. And we're, we're not quite there yet. We know what the degree of a tropical plane curve, we know what the genus is. We now know also that 3D plus G minus one points is the right number of points to count tropical curve with, uh, to count tropical curves through. But there are a few more details to, uh, to discuss before we can really write down this definition. But nevertheless, I want to mention that this is where we are going and that these are going to be the numbers we discuss in detail next time. So I think this is a good moment to stop for today, unless you have some questions. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, maybe uh, any questions? Uh, yeah, there are a few. We discussed, we discussed genus for uh, cubic curves. Elliptic curves are one of those. So are there any other curves like that? Sorry, I didn't quite understand. Uh, are there any curves like what? Uh, we discussed genus for cubic curves. For cubic curves, yeah. Elliptic curves are one of those, right? Yes, yes. Um, so, yes. Are there I, any other curves like that? I, I can, I, I'll draw a picture of an elliptic cubic for you in, in a second, give me a moment. Just before I go ahead and do that, I need some space. I, I can erase all this. Is there a question about what I wrote right here before I erase it? My question is that, uh, okay, you discussed about the elliptic curve. Uh, yeah, no, no, I understood the question. I understood the question. I'm, I'm about to show an example, but I need some space. So I'm about to erase. Yes. I just wanted to know whether there's anything that I should mention before erasing. No, no, everything is clear no. in this way. Fantastic. Just, uh, Anna, just one thing. Uh, can you just uh, say more about that uh, R2 cross R positive yes. side? Okay. Okay, let me, okay, now now I took too many questions at the same time. It was my fault because I asked you to give me more. Okay, <laughs> give me a moment. I first draw an elliptic tropical plane cubic. And then I'll answer the question about the bounded edges, okay? So I'm drawing a nice Newton subdivision, which is very symmetric. It's called the honeycomb subdivision. And then I'm going to draw a tropical curve, which is dual to this. So 
context. And this is an example of a smooth tropical cubic. It has a cycle. Now you can see the cycle. There's no way to resolve. It is just there. Yeah, and, and it's it's also trivially parameterized. The parameterizing graph I would draw in the same way and then just a map meeting uh, going to this. Does that answer the elliptic curve question? This is just one example, of course. You can take any subdivision that has this interior point and has only triangles adjacent to it, not um, not a quadrangle, because a quadrangle or a parallelogram, sorry, a parallelogram could reside in a crossing, right? But a picture like this is another example. Also a tropical, smooth tropical cubic of genus one. Does that answer the elliptic curve question? Uh, uh, okay, uh, yeah. Almost. Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. So now about the bounded edges again. Maybe we can just use the same example and discuss the dimension of this space here a bit. Let's take this combinatorial type. And when I say this combinatorial type, I mean I want to keep the directions of every edge. Yeah, all those directions are going to be fixed, but the global shift and then the length are not fixed. So um, how many lengths do I have? Let's, let me give out some names. I have L1, L2, and L3, and then L4, L5, L6, L7, L8, and L9, right? And I can vary L1, L2, and L3 independently, because I can make them as long as I want. They are not part in, of any cycle. Yeah, I can make this longer here, even longer as I wish, right? And the same down here, the same up here. But the other edges I cannot vary independently. So I have L4, L5, L6, L7, L8, and L9 have to satisfy an equation. And the equation is, 0, 1 times L4 plus 1, 1 times L5 plus 1, 0 times L6 plus 0, minus 1 times L7 plus minus 1, minus 1 times L8 plus minus 1, 0 times L9 is 0. These are, in fact, two equations. And they are precisely the equations that say this loop has to close up. Yeah, I just put those vectors here one after the other. This is the vector of that has direction 0, 1 and length L4. So to go from here to here, I go 0, 1 times L4 and so on. Yeah, so this, these are the two equations that my loop has to close up. And so I have the R to the two for shifting the whole picture around. And then I have times R bigger zero to the nine because nine is the number of bounded edges. And then inside this, I have this two equality. I need to cut out, cut out polyhedron given by those two equation. And that is, the set of tropical curves of this combinatorial. And so it has dimension uh, 2 plus 9 minus 2, which is 9. Does that help? Does that answer the yeah, question yeah, with yeah. the Thank you. bounded Thank edges? You very much. Okay. Yeah. Great. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, any other question from the audience? Mm. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Thank you very much. I, I have a question about this four valent. Um, Dual, uh, the, the dual graph that you showed us. Um, mm -hmm. So you, you said that we could resolve it. So you resolved it one way, but then you could also resolve it the other way. And yes, you're absolutely so, right. 
it seems that the resolution kind of degenerates to this covalent thing. So yes, the, yes. The greater scheme of things in enumerative geometry does this um, relate to any wall crossing phenomenon or something? Or do you have? Um, I don't think it's it's a bit. Uh, yeah, a bit more mon mundane somehow. So what this tell it tells us, you are you are actually heading towards understanding the structure of the tropical moduli space, which is great, because the tropical moduli space does not only contain the top dimensional cells. I was just trying to understand the dimension, right? Because I wanted to understand how many points do I need to fix in order to get to dimension zero, right? So I only went to sort of like, what is the highest dimension? What are the highest dimensional cells I can have. But then if you want to understand the whole modelized space, you don't only have those high dimensional cells, you also have lower dimensional cells. And for example, the cells of co-dimension one are precisely the ones that correspond to tropical curves that have one four valent vertex. And then the, there are in general three ways to resolve a three valent vertex. And that tells you just that such a co-dimension one cone will be adjacent to three top dimensional cones. And that is super important to understand the local structure of the tropical modulized space in order to prove results, for example, about um, the invariance of a tropical curve count and things like that. But I don't think that it somehow relates directly to any sort of wall crossing phenomenon. Right, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions? Uh, yeah, if this is the case, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Hannah. And uh, may you just uh, brief something about your forthcoming lecture? What are your targets? What are your plans in the tomorrow's lecture, which is going to be the last one? Yes, yeah, that's a very good question also, because I, I want you to <laughs> still care and be interested. So I hope you'll, you'll come for the next class also. Right. So my plan is, as I hinted a little bit already, I want to then really introduce those numbers NDG TROP. We have some vague idea what they do. They somehow count tropical curves, but there are a few details to be filled in to make this precise. I want to then mention Michalkin's correspondence theorem, which tells us that if we count algebraic tropical curves, we do what we want. We do we, do count, we get the same number as we do in the algebraic world. This is a very deep theorem, so I won't offer proof for that, but I want to state it. And then I want to give you, I want to end by showing you a way how to determine those numbers on the tropical side, because this is still not easy, right? Like if I give you two points, yes, you can sit down and draw the tropical line through those two points, that's not so bad. But if I give you five points, and ask you draw the tropical conic that passes through those five points, you start to sweat a little already. And I start to sweat also. I, I would have to, it would take me an hour or two probably to figure this out. Yeah? So the problem is, so, so on this side, it's an algebraic geometry problem and it's really terrible. So it took, took centuries for people to, to come up with recursions for this. On the other side, the problem is much simpler because we are only counting piecewise linear graphs in R2 satisfying point conditions, but it is still complicated. And we need to understand the combinatorial essence of this problem in a deeper way in order to really come up with a solution of this counting. And that's what I want to show you in the last class. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Anna. Uh, let's give a cup of applause for oh, our lecture. <laughs> Looking forward for your last lecture tomorrow. Thank you. Sure, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much.